Lord, we ask as we get into your word today that your Holy Spirit would be at work in our midst, that this wouldn't just be a motivational speech, that it would be faithful teaching of your word, guide what I say, and guide what we hear. And I ask that you would penetrate our hearts, that we wouldn't just be inspired, that we wouldn't experience just information that, that causes inspiration, but Lord, that your Holy Spirit would create transformation in our hearts. To the glory of your name, Jesus, and everyone said, amen. amen. If I showed you a symbol, this symbol right here, what would you call that? At. At is what most of you would say. I'm wondering if there is anyone learned enough to know what that symbol is properly called. Anyone know what it's really named? Ampersand? No, that's the end looking thing. You know, the funny end. Anyone know what that might be really called? No. No one knows. It's actually properly called at the rate. That's what that symbol is called, the at the rate symbol. See, it was originally used in the wonderfully riveting world of accounting. <laughs> Chris? At the rate is a symbol that was used to help companies account so much at the rate of so much. Then in 1971, a man named Ray Tomlinson was creating this little thing that would help society move forward a little bit, something called email. Maybe you've heard of it. And as he was creating email, he needed to find a symbol that he could insert to separate a user's name from the host terminal. And so he picked one of the least used symbols on the keyboard, the at rate symbol, and that began the shift of what we understand this, sim this symbol to mean today, what we would call the at, how we would at mention someone or tag someone online. Today, this symbol really represents not an abacus and counting your beads, but something much bigger than mathematical calculations. It today represents connection. It represents Connection. You type an at symbol or an at the rate symbol to connect with someone properly over email. And hopefully you don't get that nasty return that says mail or demon or whatever, like you got your address wrong. You've got to get it right. You use it to connect or, or tag someone or mention someone in a tweet or making sure they saw your Facebook post or that they saw your picture of them on Instagram even the project management software that we use as staff and leaders in the church, this program called Basecamp, lets us tag each other by using the at the rate symbol so that when I want to say, hey, Rick, do you have anything other than Crocs? I can tag him and know that he's going to see it. <laughs> Love you, buddy. What's the first thing that you think when you see a notification that someone tagged you in a post? What's the feeling that you have? It could be mixed. It could be one way or another. When you get that notification that someone at mentioned you or tagged you, you might feel excitement or optimism. You might get a rush of dopamine. The, oh, man, let me, let me go see what it is. Oh, another video of cats and cucumbers. <laughs> if you haven't ever, if you're going cats and cucumbers, get on YouTube, search cats, cucumbers, and let the rest of your day be filled with joy, okay? <laughs> you might feel, on the other hand, when you get that notification for an app mention, you might feel a sense of terror, of dread. Oh, man, is this another keyboard warrior troll who's coming at me? Or, oh, man, they tagged me in a picture. Hopefully they got my good side. Am I going to look fat? Are some of the thoughts that we have. Imagine sitting in the first century church in Rome, and for nearly an hour, the Apostle Paul has been being read, meaning a dear sister by the name of Phoebe, a faithful servant in the body of Christ, comes all the way to Rome, and she hand delivers this letter from Paul to the elders of your church that then they read to the congregation, and it takes about an hour, even though it's taken us 33 weeks. 
an hour of reading this letter, and it's winding down. It's getting to the very end, what we call chapter 16, even though there weren't chapters back then. And as, as this letter is being read amongst all of us, Paul starts dropping names. He starts listing out names, naming people. And although this letter has had you all over the spectrum of emotions, that you've gone from feeling convicted over your sin to rejoicing in the saving grace of God that conquers your sin, to feeling challenged to offer your life and lay yourself down as a living sacrifice acceptable to God in the way that we live, to being implored to fight for unity within the church family, so much just a fire hose of doctrine and theology and application orthodoxy and orthopraxy and then the reader as they're winding down Paul shifts writing into this post where he tags or mentions 26 people by name and a couple without name if you're in the room how are you feeling as he starts mentioning people by name you might find yourself going oh oh I I hope he's gonna say my name Is Paul going to mention me? Or perhaps you're someone who's heard that Paul sometimes calls people out by name. We're talking about Euodia and Syntyche in Philippi. When he wrote the letter to Philippi, and in chapter 4, Paul says, Hey, ladies, Euodia, Syntyche, about time to get along, isn't it? Could you maybe find some agreement and stop fighting? Imagine sitting in that church service where that letter's being read and you're one of those two ladies and your name gets dropped and you're like, oof. And afterwards you walk up to each other and you're kind of like, man, we should, uh, we should probably work this out, shouldn't we? And so who knows what you might be feeling. As Paul begins the conclusion of his letter, he reveals the depth of connection of genuine love, affection, and care that he has for the believers in the church. And there's quite a few things we can learn from this list, a list that would maybe otherwise to us modern Westerners, we might see as a pretty boring list of just naming a bunch of names, but I think there's a few things we could take away from it. One of the main things, the primary thing I want you to take away from this, this massive, shocking statement, you matter. Did you know that? You matter. You matter to God, first and foremost. You matter to the people of God. You matter to the mission of God. And let me just say this. If there's anyone hearing my voice right now who feels insignificant, feels unseen, unheard, uncared for, unloved, feels like you don't matter, like you don't contribute much, or like you don't bring much to the table. I'm not gifted like you. I can't do the things that you do. I'm not like that. I wish I could sing like them. I wish I could do this. Let me just tear down the insecure, seeded lies of the enemy to say, you matter. In Romans 16, Paul begins the closing of his letter as he names names, Verse 1, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Sincrea, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Man, let's just pause pretty quick. Man, (coughs) excuse me. Do we welcome each other in the Lord, notice this, in a way worthy of the saints? Do we welcome each other in a way that is worthy of the people of God? What does that even look like? Does that mean like red carpet treatment, roll it out for each other? Let me say this. The church... Any body of believers, those who have received the grace, mercy, and forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ on the cross, ought to be the most welcoming place in the world. 
And if we're not, <coughs> excuse me, we got to look in the mirror. We ought to be the most welcoming place in the world. <coughs> excuse me. Paul's implying that there is a manner in which we are to welcome other brothers and sisters in Christ, other believers, and that there is a way that is worthy and at the same time, that kind of also implies that there is a way that is unworthy of welcoming each other. I just got to say this convicted me. It's really convicted me and challenged me. Do we welcome each other in a way that is worthy of the people of God, worthy of our forever family, the holy and beloved of the Father, bought by the Son, and dwelled by the Spirit of God? And sometimes I just go, I was convicted over this. And am I welcoming each brother and sister in Christ in a way that is worthy of the saints? People who have been forgiven and reconciled and made one in one spirit, in one baptism, one faith, one Lord. The gravity supreme of what we know and believe and have experienced and somehow... We can just go, hi. <clears throat> Paul goes on and after saying, let's welcome her in a way worthy of the saints. He says, and help her in whatever she may need from you. Phoebe is noted as a servant of the church. She's been a patron of many, he says. She's known for how much she's helped others. Paul says, she's helped me a ton too. She's helped a ton of other people. She's helped me. Let's help her too. And then he says this, <clears throat> in whatever way she needs. He doesn't say, if she needs help with this, help her out. He doesn't say, if you find her in this context needing help, you can pitch in and jump in. But don't worry about these other things. No, he just opens the floodgates wide open of opportunity to say, help her in whatever way she needs. Man, what if... What if an apostle of God with the authority as a delegate from God says to you, help them in whatever way they may need? We might think, well, but what if they need money? What if they need my time? What if they need a place to stay? What if they need a meal? What if they need a ride? What if they need to borrow a car? What if they need tools? What if they need me to help them move? <laughs> Paul says, in whatever way help is needed, I'll say this. Whenever you can, help whoever you can in whatever way you can. Whenever, as often as possible, see yourself as someone who God put in environments and in relationships and in circumstances as a helper. Do you see yourself as someone that God strategically and intentionally placed in a place or placed in a moment or placed in a relationship so that you could help? Our flesh changes this perspective to where we tend to see ourselves in dynamics as those who get help. And it takes looking at the sacrificial service, the offering, the servanthood of our Savior Jesus Christ, who we are to emulate and follow and learn from to recognize God has us here to help. So whenever you can, I would say as often as you can, help whoever you can. Well, who? This person or that person? No. Whoever you can, in whatever way you can, let's be helpers. Verse 3, let's move on. He says, greet Prisca in other places she's called, or uh, she's called Priscilla. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life. To whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church 
in their house. Let me just pause now to say Priscilla and Aquila could potentially have an entire sermon dedicated to their expo- exploits on Christ's mission. They're mentioned in 1 Corinthians 16, they're mentioned in 2 Timothy 4, and they're mentioned multiple times in Acts chapter 18. What we know of them is that they were tent makers by trade. That was their skill, their profession, their job. The same trade that Paul is noted as having. And one of the things they did was when Paul was in town, they hosted him, let him stay in their house, and they made tents together while they talked and worked on the mission of God. They also went out every weekend to try with Paul to persuade people to come to faith in Christ. They then traveled after that. They were like, hey, let's go with Paul. They just jumped in on the missionary journey and began traveling with him. That's like a foreign concept to us that we would think about and entertain and be willing to do that. Hey, you know what? Let's just drop it. Let's go and let's join Paul on his mission. They risked, as just noted, their very lives. They put their neck out being willing to lose their lives to help Paul out. And a lot of times I, we can think, I want to do that for Jesus, but isn't that a kind of dangerous place? Priscilla and Aquila are like, we'll put our necks out. They're noted as teaching up an up and coming preacher named Apollos. Maybe you've heard of him and Paul mentions him in his letters to the Corinthians and he's mentioned in Acts a few times that that Priscilla and Aquila heard Apollo's teaching and after he finished, they kind of pulled him to the side and said, hey man, wow, gifted communicator and you're telling people about Jesus and we're so thrilled about that. Hey, um, on this doctrinal issue though, you're a little off. And it says they taught him a more accurate way or explained to him the way of God more accurately. Not only that, but they hosted a church in their home When it was still scary to have church out in public and churches were in homes, Priscilla and Aquila were like, we've got a place. Come on in. Let's welcome them. Man, talk about a powerhouse of a godly couple. Batman and Catwoman ain't got nothing on Priscilla and Aquila. Legitimate heroes of the faith who poured themselves out and laid themselves down. And we can see in just a few places they're mentioned in the New Testament that they did not count their lives dear to themselves. They did not live their lives to prioritize their comfort and their convenience and what they preferred and what they wanted, but they took the vessel of their lives and they said, God, use us, man. Continuing in verse five, he said, greet my beloved, Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Man, if you're Epinetus and you're hearing that read and you're going, man, I'm the first person that God saved in Asia, you're probably turning in that moment to go, thank you, Jesus. Verse 6, greet Mary who has worked hard for you. Can you imagine being Mary when that's read? She's probably beaming, smiling ear to ear, hearing her name not only mentioned, but mentioned as a hard worker for the kingdom of God. Wouldn't you love to have your name drop that way? What would it feel like to have your name mentioned by the apostle who then says, and they're a hard worker in the kingdom of God. In fact, if you pay close attention to this chapter, you'll notice more than a handful of women are mentioned for their work in the kingdom of God. Ladies, sisters, you have a part to play in the kingdom of God. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Let's look at verse 7. He then says, greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles and they were in Christ before me. As Paul mentions Andronicus and Junia, most scholars, not all, most believe them to have been another married couple. Missionaries, actually. And Paul kind of says, hey, their reputation precedes them. He says they're well known among the apostles, well known to the apostles. And he even points out that they had been imprisoned for their faith like Paul, 
but they were believers before Paul. He's like sitting there saying, guys, these two have been following Christ longer than I have. They were in jail for Jesus, just like me, but they've been following him longer than me. Greet them on my part. Let's go on to verse 8. He says, greet Ampliatus, my beloved and the Lord. This would be kind of like, like saying, man, tell, tell Ampliatus hi for me because I love that dude. I love that guy. Do you have anybody you feel that way about? And when you think about them, think about a brother, a sister in the Lord that you just go, man, I love that dude. I love that girl in the Lord. Like the Lord just stirs up my affections for them because they're so incredible. Verse 9, it says, greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ and my beloved Stachys. Again, two more guys one another worker in the mission of Christ, and to another, Paul's like, I love that dude too. Greet him for me. Verse 10, he says, greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. What does that mean? Well, this is to say that Apelles is identified as one who had been tried and found to be trustworthy. That's what he's saying there. This may well refer to a specific incident in which he had proved to be a faithful believer. Maybe not, but it's clear at least at this point that Paul's saying this person has been tried, tested, and proven as faithful. It's the equivalent of someone to saying you, hey, you can count on John. If, he's gonna, if he said he's going to be there, he's going to be there. Man, if, if John says that he's going to do something, he's going to do it. He's faithful. He's approved. You can take it to the bank. Don't we all want to be that way? Where scripture teaches us, let our yes be yes and our no be no. That we want to be people of our word, people who follow through. Lord, help us live that out. Let's continue on in verse 10. He said, greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Here's the deal. There was historically a household of Aristobulus, the household of Aristobulus in Rome during the era that this letter was written. He was the brother of Agrippa I, who was a friend and confidant of Claudius, the emperor of Rome. Now, if, which is a big if, because it's not historically clear that this is the same Aristobulus, but it's possible, we just don't know, but if, if it were the same household, then Paul would have had what we call friends in high places. And it's clear in Scripture that Paul's hope was to go to Rome in hopes that he could make his way to present the gospel to the emperor. He dictated that multiple places. And so it's possible that Paul had begun making connections and relationships to try and get the gospel presented at the highest levels of influence. Let's look at verse 11. He says, Greet my kinsmen, Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. He mentions another kinsman, Herodian. He greets him. And then there's a family, another family here of Narcissus that's mentioned that, again, has some really interesting uh, potential historical uh, connections there if he's the wealthy freedman who served the emperor Claudius which also might make some interesting connections to that other family that was just mentioned. But that's not really helpful for our topic today anyway. So I'm going to tell the nerd in me to be quiet and we'll move on. Verse 12. He said, greet those workers in the Lord, Trephina and Trephosa. Greet the beloved Persis who has worked hard in the Lord. Right there in verse 12, here are three more women that Paul mentions as hard workers. Just think for a moment, who comes to your mind when you think of hardworking women in the kingdom of God in our local context? You could probably look across the room and lay your eyes on a couple that you go, that's one, that's one. It's what Paul's doing right here. He just names three more women who's like, man, these are some hardworking women on Christ's mission. Verse 13 Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. 
So my first thought here is, I feel like Rufus is a massively underutilized name. (laughs) Any parents in the house with a baby boy on the way, here's your softball pitch, man, knock it out of the park. Let's get some more Rufuses in the church. I'm not joking. I think it's a cool name. So if you're sitting there and you're like, your name's Rufus and I haven't met you, I like your name. (laughs) Now, we can't be really sure But there's a chance that this is the same Rufus that's mentioned in Mark chapter 15 as the son of Simon the Cyrene. Yes, the Simon who was asked to help Jesus carry his cross up the hill of Calvary. In the book of Mark, there's this guy, Rufus, mentioned as the son of that guy. And I just think how amazing would it be, how cool would that be, that this dude was so impacted, of course... As the guy drags Jesus' cross up the hill of Calvary, potentially as he saw the resurrected Christ after watching him crucified, seeing him raised on the third day, that his family, his son Rufus and his wife, became laborers for the gospel and even made an impact on the Apostle Paul. How amazing would that be? Paul even says, man, Rufus' mom became like a second mom to me. Let's go on in verse 14. He says, Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and brothers who are with them. I probably said a couple of those names wrong. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Just more and more and more people that Paul knows or knows of and loves. So he says, hey, don't forget about those guys too. Tell them all hi. Let them know I'm thinking about them and I'm praying about them, that they're on my heart, that they're in my mind. And now the most important verse in the whole chapter, verse 16, greet one another with a holy kiss. We have not been living biblically. All right, when it's time to leave, I want to see everybody turn to your neighbor, pucker up. And if your first time here today at Word of Grace, you're like, I am never coming back. (laughs) Oh, man. Every person you greeted today without kissing, you were sinning. (laughs) No, what does that look like for us today? Because that's very clearly a cultural gap. I think it would much more today look for us like, Greet each other with a holy hug. This might make you uncomfortable, but I think we should hug more. I've been trying to do this more. When people come up to me and they're sticking their hand out, I've been trying more and more to just go, hey, let's be on hugging terms. And if we're really brothers and sisters in Christ, why not? Well, because it's awkward. Yeah. Yeah. We got to press through awkward to get to awesome. And if we don't have the level of connection and affection that warrants, bring it in. Is that not a baseline of the affection for people who have been saved from sin and death? with a common Savior, a common faith, a common spirit, a common message, a common Lord that we are all commonly, eagerly longing to see one day. What if we hugged more? That'd be cool. Paul took his time tagging at mentioning a bunch of people, mentioning them by name, And even as Paul's writing this letter, as he's dictating it to his scribe who's writing it for him, Paul's probably sitting there thinking, man, I I know I missed somebody. You ever been there? You ever felt like that? Just two weeks ago at VBS, the last night, I'm walking around with my cell phone. I'm taking pictures of every volunteer because I want to post and just say, look at everybody who made this happen. And I know I missed some that night. And I know there were some who weren't there that night. And I'm sitting there going, oh, I know I missed some people. I guarantee you Paul's thinking that way. But let me ask you this. Are you living and loving in a way that's worth mentioning? 
Are you living and loving in a way that if Paul wrote a letter to our church, that he would say, man, tell Greg and Jackie hi. They're doing some good work for the kingdom. Tell Andy and Jean, I'm so glad that they're doing what they're doing, pastor to pastor, serving other preachers. Man, thank God for Dave and Chris. I'm so thankful for, and here I am doing the thing where I'm leaving a bunch of people out. I want to be careful here because there's a fine line between living for the applause of men versus the applause of God. Amen? There's a fine line there. And when someone commends you or praises you or applauds you or thanks you, man, turn that in gratitude and worship to the Lord and, of course, to the individual. But be careful not to become a servant of the applause of men. Because if you live for the applause of men, you will be destroyed by the criticism of men. We want to live for the applause of heaven. Amen. We want to live to please God. Amen. We want to be thinking, how can I put a smile on his face? Amen. And let me say, if you live that way before the face of God, quorum Deo, constantly living, how can I please God, serve God, obey God, worship God, honor God, you're going to live in a way that's worth mentioning. So ask yourself, am I, am I living, am I serving, am I giving, am I caring in a way that would cause someone else to go, man, tell so-and-so hi, I love that dude. Man, if you see them, give them a hug for me. Can you tell them I miss them? If Paul was writing a letter to Word of Grace, who would he mention and why? You might think Paul would be like, Hey, tell Pastor Stephen, my homie, my beloved, blah, blah, blah. No. (laughs) Not what I was looking for. Thank you. I think he'd be more like, hey, guys, I commend to you Sandra and Troy and Laura and Dawn and Alyssa and Shane and Christina and Doug and Kristen and David and Christy and Michelle and Esther and Jody and the other Laura and Samantha and Jasmine and Jessica and Marco and Becky and Charity because those are the names that are rocking our babies in the nursery and are praying over our babies. Yeah. While we're worshiping Jesus and sitting under the teaching of his word, maybe he'd expand that list to mention the over 80 who make the entire kids' wing happen every Sunday. Maybe he would say, man, those sacrificial servants, you know, who think, I can love someone else by loving their child while they love the Lord. Paul might say, hey, make sure you greet Clyde for me, that dude who makes sure that this facility stays pristine. And if you're sitting there thinking, well, I mean, he's on staff. It's kind of his job. Let me tell you about the time that I talked to Clyde and I said, hey, you don't need to clean the toilets every day. Once a week is good enough. And Clyde in tears says, it's for the Lord, pastor. Greet Clyde for me. Paul might say, man, tell Steve and Jenny hi for me because they might be the most green light, happy to serve people I've ever met. He might say, man, tell Greg and Carol I, I miss them and I'm so thankful that they have chosen to serve every family who's grieving the loss of a loved one at a funeral by serving them meals. I could do this for hours, guys. I can't tell you how many times I've told my wife, I've told my family in Texas and in Arkansas, we are so blessed with some of the most amazing people in our church family. (laughs) My parents are probably annoyed. (laughs) They come and visit, and I'm like, man, mom and dad, we've got this amazing family in our church who does this. Man, there's this guy in our church who, who does this. And 
man, there's this teenager in the youth group that, man, they're sold out for Jesus like this. And man, there's these young adults who started this because they just love the Lord and love other young adults. Like I could sit there and go on and on and I could spend the rest of the day doing this and still miss names. When I think about what I've experienced, what I've witnessed, what I've heard, there's a letter, a story of people loving each other, serving each other, caring for each other, genuinely sacrificing, sharing in life, bearing one another's burdens, guys getting together to build a ramp for the elderly or build a ramp for someone who's battling cancer, people showing up to grieve and mourn with those who have lost a loved one, people making meals and delivering them for those who had surgery or had a baby or had a sickness, had hard times, people giving to families who lost their homes in fires, People helping each other with projects at their homes. People giving financially, sacrificially to help us get the new life center done. People sweating together as they prepare our new life center for our youth and for our church and for our staff and for our community. People pulling together to throw bittersweet goodbye parties for those who are moving. People giving their off days to help each other move. People giving their evenings to serve 105 kids at our VBS for four days in a row. People calling and texting and visiting to check on each other. People giving the less fortunate rides to church. People opening up their homes on holidays to those who don't have family close. People giving financially or with other material resources to help someone who's found hard times. Guys, when the people of God, the body of Christ, when we live like Christ and go deep in community together, it is a beautiful and profound and amazing and noteworthy mentioning thing. God is glorified in it. Even more so when it's not mentioned. Even more so when no one's going to see it but the Father. And Jesus says, when you do your good deeds, don't let your left hand know what the right hand's doing, that your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now some of you are sitting there and you're wrestling with a few thoughts. Why didn't he mention me? Some in the church at Rome might have felt the same way. From a biblical perspective, it sounds like amazing opportunity to grow in humility. To say, thank you, Lord, but I wasn't mentioned and and I know you saw. Listen, in a church of over 500 people, I missed a lot of people. And some of the other thoughts that some of you might be wrestling with is, well, no one ever does that stuff for me. I hear those stories and I I hear that, but how come I haven't felt that? How come I I haven't seen that? How come no one invites me or reaches out to me or, or helps me or cares for me? Listen, I'll say, if you've ever felt unseen or unloved, that's not okay. We don't want that to be true for anyone. And all of us as a church family should take it upon ourselves to never let someone feel missed or invisible, or overlooked, or unvalued among us. Amen. But I want to say one thing further. Listen, you can complain that you don't have it, or you can cultivate it. So many times we sit here and go, well, I'm not invited, I'm not included, no one reached out to me. Invite, include, and reach out. You can complain about it, or you can cultivate it. You can whine that no one invites you, or you can begin inviting. You can be sad you weren't included, or you can include. 
You can feel lonely or you can kill loneliness with hospitality. Don't carry a victim mentality. Cultivate community via hospitality with genuine love and care. We see this list of names and it shows us once more, you matter. Whether I mentioned you or not, you matter. You matter to God, you matter to God's family, you matter to God's mission. We all have a part to play and I pray by the Holy Spirit that God helps us walk this beautiful community out to the glory of his name, amen.